Yeah. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Par Prahar with us today. He's going to tell us about soft factorization in uh, non-abelian gauge theories. Um, so ju just to remind everyone, you can directly ask questions or also put it in the chat. I will be keeping a tab on the chat. Um, okay. Over to you, Prahar. Okay. Thank you, Alok. So uh, I'd, I'd obviously like to start by thanking all the organizers for hosting an amazing conference, especially during this time. Unfortunately, most of the conference is after like 2 a.m. my time. So I haven't been there for all the talks, but I'm sure they went amazing as well. So today um, uh, I'm going to talk about soft factorization in non-abelian gauge theories. Um, and let me just start off straight away with what I mean, uh, what, what I'm actually going to do. So the, I'm going to impose large gauge invariance, which I'm going to explain what that is. Uh, on the S matrix, and I'm going to show that uh, imposing this leads to what's what I'm calling soft factorization, and that what that means will become clear as I as I continue with the talk. The tool that I'll be using for this is the covariant phase space formalism. So if you haven't heard about this, that's okay. That's essentially going to be a large part of the first half of my talk, where I'm going to explain what this formalism is, is and how it applies to to what I'm interested in. Now, while the main result is is interesting in its own right. I'd say m most of the interesting stuff happens as like as we go towards the main result, things that we learn along the way. And one of the most important things I think that if, if nothing else I'd like you to take away is that in a gauge theory, you actually have infinitely many vacuum states. And uh, we'll, we'll derive all of these uh, as well. And in particular, this, uh, this feature of soft factorization uh, will lead us to the soft gluon theorem, single as well as multiple, uh, but multiple consecutive. Uh, in fact, uh, we are currently working on multiple uh, simultaneous as well. And it's one of the reasons why originally the paper was supposed to come out this month, but we have had to push it back by, by a month to try and understand the simultaneous soft limit. We think we're there, uh, but uh, not all the kings have been smoothed out yet. Okay. So the result in itself, what I'm going to talk about is, I think at the level of soft gluon theorem in itself interesting, but I think for future work is far more interesting. We can actually start talking about infrared finite S matrices. Of course, a lot of interesting work has happened um, in this regard recently. So it'll be good to connect the, the discussion here to, for example, the work of Matthew Schwartz. Um, and more interestingly, perhaps it might give some insight to flat holography. In particular, the story will show that any gauge, th the dual theory of any gauge theory must necessarily contain some Katz Moody currents. And it, 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 it'll be important to understand the physics of these Katz Moody currents in the context of scattering amplitudes. Okay. Um, so uh, the outline of the talk will be the following. In the first uh, section, I'll just talk about what the covariant phase space formalism is. Uh, the references for this, I think Wald Ayer is very good. It has a great, uh, um, the exp exposition on this topic. Then I'll essentially apply the formalism to gauge theories, to non-abelian gauge theories. And a lot of, this is of course a huge topic about uh, related asymptotic symmetry. So I'll just refer you to Andy's lecture notes on this. You can go, there's a lot of references in there and there's a lot of detail. So once we construct the phase space, which is what the covariant phase space formalism does for us, in section three, we'll quantize the phase space and then construct the Hilbert space for gauge theories. And in doing so, we'll see that there's infinitely many vacuum states. We'll then impose large gauge invariance uh, on the S matrix. We'll, we'll, we'll first define the S matrix and we'll impose large gauge invariance on that quantity. And we'll derive the main result in section four. And in five and six, I'll essentially take that result and then show that it implies soft theorems. And six, we'll make some comments about future work. Okay, so essentially one and two will be uh, technically detailed. So I'll try to go slow. And if anyone has any questions in that, please stop me right away. And, and you can ask at, a, at any time. Most of it after that is just application of the formalism. So there's, there's some tedious algebra involved, but there's not much new physics going on over there. Okay, so let's just start with the uh, covariant phase space formalism. So we'll back up a little bit. The first question is, let's just review what a phase space is. Uh, so I'm sure you've, you, you, you know all of this, but let's recap it in a language that will be more useful for, for what I'm going to say. So a phase space is essentially the configuration space 
of, of my system. By which I mean, you, you consider a bunch of particles and the particles have positions and momenta. So the set of all possible positions and momenta of all the particles in your theory is a space. And that space is what we call the phase space. And we typically use the notation of QI PI, where you have QI referring to momenta, PI, ref uh, sorry, QI referring to coordinates, PI referring to momenta. But the idea of what we'll do today is that we'll be talking about covariant phase space. So we want to introduce covariant notation. So I'm just going to talk about generalized coordinates on this on the phase space, which I'm just going to call X mu. And you should just think of it as coordinates and momenta. Okay. So uh, the phase space has more structure. It's not just a collection of points. It's not just a collection of configurations. It has a little bit more structure. In particular, it has uh, a two form on this phase space, which is called the symplectic form. And again, in the standard P, P, Q variables, it just takes this nice uh, Darbo form. So this thing is called the Darbo form. Okay, it has two properties which are important. The first one is that it's closed. And uh, so D omega is zero, which locally implies that omega is D theta. We'll forget about topological issues. They're very interesting, but it's not it's beyond the scope of this talk. So let's assume that um, omega is d theta everywhere on the phase space. And in particular, uh, theta, again, if written out in the standard position and momentum coordinate uh, basis, this thing is over here is theta. And secondly, it's invertible, by which I mean omega mu nu as a matrix is an anti-symmetric matrix is determinant to zero is not zero. So it's an anti-symmetric matrix with a non-vanishing determinant, which means that the phase space is necessarily even dimensional because odd dimensional anti-symmetric matrices always have zero determinant. So you necessarily, a phase space is always even dimensional. Here you can see it's always Q and P. So there's always, they always come in pairs. Okay. Another important uh, idea in sort of the, the phase space is the idea of canonical transformations. A canonical transformation really written in this covariant notation is really just a diffeomorphism on the phase space, which preserves omega. So the lead derivative is zero. And because omega is closed, it implies a very nice form. So, so we can quickly prove this. So L, uh, the, the lead derivative of omega by a standard identity in differential geometry, lead derivative is simply So this is just a very standard identity. And again, uh, because, the, because omega is closed, the second term vanishes. So this just tells me that uh, D of I psi omega is zero. But again, I'm not gonna worry about topological issues. This implies that I psi omega, this is the one form is equal to D of some function. And I'm gonna denote this function H C. It's called the Hamiltonian charge corresponding to the canonical transformation. In index notation, this is what it means. Okay, but you can also invert this. Inversely speaking, given any function f on the phase space, you can define a vector field in this way. And by construction, this vector field is necessarily a canonical transformation. Okay, so there's this nice map between functions and vector fields, which is something that, that holds true on, uh, on a phase space. We'll exploit this quite a lot. And in particular, and finally, we'll talk about the Poisson bracket, which is, you may have seen other definitions, but this is the definition that we'll, we'll go with. They're of course one and the same. So what you do is you take, you take a function f and g, and you compute the vector field that maps, that corresponds to this vector field. I've just told you there's a one-to-one -one mapping between vector fields and functions. And then you just compute the inner product of omega with those vector fields. And that's how you define the, the, the Poisson bracket of two functions on a phase space. Okay, this is just some basic review of phase space. Any questions? Okay, uh, good. So let's just now generalize it further to now to just go straight to field theories. So in a field theory, uh, the phase space is defined by a configuration space. So you have a field a space of all field configurations, which is I'm ge generically denoting by phi of x. And what I mean by this is in principle, it could contain scalar fields, 
vector fields, gauge fields, you know, whatever fields you are in your theory, this, you collect all of those fields into, into one big vector. And, and I'm calling that uh, curly phi. Uh, in this notation, variations of fields, delta phi is a vector. And I've, for, for, to understand this, I've drawn a nice, uh, I've drawn a simple diagram here. So essentially phi is, as I've just said, is a point on gamma because it's a particular field configuration. So it refers to a point. Then phi plus delta phi is a slightly, is a neighboring point. So I'm assuming delta phi is, is very small. So it's a closely, close neighboring point. Then you can just draw an arrow between those two points. So it defines a vector for us in the tangent space of this point. Okay, so in other words, delta phi is a, a vector in the tangent space of phi. Uh, theta, this theta was the symplectic form right here. Remember, is a one form on phase space. So in coordinate free notation, what is a one form? A one form is something that takes a vector as an input and, and returns, a ve uh, returns a number. So that's what this notation means. It's a function, it takes in a vector, which is a variation, as I've just explained, and returns a number. And it returns it in this way. So just as an example, if you had, if, if I was dealing with scalar fields, then, then this is what I mean. So this, this is a point on the phase space. Delta phi is a tangent vector on the tangent space of that point. And then you just evaluate this integral. That's a number. And that's the number that you get when I say theta of delta. Okay. Similarly, omega is a two form, which is d theta. And again, in coordinate free notation, this is what that means. This is just some basic review from differential geometry. And uh, the mapping that I told you, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between functions and vector fields is uh, defined by this, this formula right here. There's also a, a, a definition for canonical transformation. A given vector delta is a canonical transformation if this property holds true. And finally, the Poisson bracket again in again in this notation is just this quantity right here okay so i've just used coordinate free notation the idea is i'm going to try and covariantize everything as much as possible okay next so we all, we've essentially covariantized everything on the phase space uh the problem is that we haven't covariantized things in space time what do i mean by that i mean everything that i defined i was thinking of phi over here as a function of spatial coordinates. So in my head, I've naturally chosen some constant t slice to define my fields on which I'm defining my fields. So uh, covariantization in space time has not yet happened. So let's now do that. We'll covariantize everything. Uh, so let's see how we we'll go about doing that. So let's just take a very simple example. We start with the Lagrangian of a scalar field, just free scalars, just for simplicity. Let's vary it. Uh, then you, the variation is of this form right here. The first term, of course, gives us equations of motion, which you, you, and you all know that. I'll be interested in this second term right here. So just to see what that means, let's take the second term. Remember uh, the Lagrangian here, I've written it in form notation. So the Lagrangian is a four form. Uh, the, this boundary term is a three form. And because it's a three form, I can integrate it over three dimensional hypersurfaces. So in particular, if I integrate it over a constant time slice, it reduces to this quantity. But this was exactly theta. This is exactly theta right here. Phi dot delta phi. So covariantization is now also in space time is now also trivial. All you need to do to define theta on a generic uh, sigma is uh, to just integrate this three form over an arbitrary sigma, and then you're done. And then everything else follows from this. You can you can compute omega by taking the exterior derivative. Then you can compute you can figure out what canonical transformations are, and everything the whole shebang everything follows once you have this. Okay, so this is it. This is the covariant phase space formalism where everything is covariantized. So let me now summarize and also generalize. So, so explain to you what I, what I mean in a completely general context. And then I'll stop for, uh, stop for questions if you have any. So uh, we take a theory which is defined by some Lagrangian form, which is a D, which is a four form. Uh, it's a function of some set of fundamental fields in your theory. 
and the fields are picked from some uh, what I'm co what's called the field space. So it's just the space of all allowed uh, configurations. So in particular, for instance, you might consider fields which have you might want to impose nice boundary conditions on the field. So that you want the boundary conditions to fall off. You want the fields to fall off at infinity. So you impose some boundary conditions, and then you say that all my fields are going to be picked from these sort of uh, configurations. You can vary the action or the Lagrangian, and you get two types of terms. You get the first term, which as you well know, you integrate by parts so that there's no derivatives acting on delta phi. That term is what gives you equations of motion. And then everything else is a boundary term. And that everything else I'm collecting into, into this piece here. So the, the field space phi was some generic field configurations. Now I'm gonna impose uh, the equations of motion, so E equal to zero. And so that's a, that's a subspace of the field space, which is called the solution space. So I've, I've drawn a diagram here for you guys. So the S, S, the, this red line is a subspace. Okay. Now, what do vector fields correspond to? And a vector field which is tangent to the solution to the solution space in green. And notice that uh, because phi satisfies on S, phi naught plus delta phi also satisfies the equations of motion. This means that delta phi satisfies linearized equations of motion in the background of phi naught. So, to summarize, the tangent space of the solution space consists of all variations delta which satisfies linearized equations uh, around the background okay and this is important because uh, this means that from now on i'm going to work exclusively in s what what that means in practice is that all my fields satisfy equations of motion all my variations satisfy linearized equations of motion okay good once we have this, then we can start defining all the quantities. So we can define theta of sigma as some as integrating this uh, this boundary field over here, this boundary guy. Um, and as we have discussed before, that is what gives you the symplectic potential. Theta is called the symplectic potential. We can further then define what's called the pre-symplectic form. I'll explain why it's not the symplectic form exactly. But one property of the pre-symplectic form is shown here, and I've missed the pre over here everywhere, is that uh, the pre-symplectic form actually doesn't depend on the Cauchy slice. Well, it depends very weakly, in, and this, this equation is true over here. So we'd like to have a system in which the phase space remains unchanged, because if the phase space is changing, this means that de your degrees of freedom are changing over time. You don't want that in, an, in, a, in, a, in a nice physical theory, especially the ones that you're interested in the context of S matrices, you want the in Hilbert space to be the same as the out Hilbert space. You don't want the Hilbert space to change as a function of time, though that might be interesting for some other purposes. So what you'd like is to set this term to zero. So we want to impose boundary conditions so that this boundary term vanishes. And once you do that, then you have a nice phase space, constant phase space independent of the choice of Cauchy slice. So we'll come back to this property. This will be very important. Um, so the reason I'm calling this a pre-symplectic form is that by construction, this is a closed form, but it's not necessarily uh, a uh, uh, an invertible form. We want it to be invertible. Remember that it had to satisfy two properties. So we do that as follows. Suppose there exists some vector such that, uh, such that this is true. If such a vector exists, that necessarily means that omega is not invertible, right? Uh, sorry, this should be delta one not equal to zero. So I have some non-zero vector such that the inner product with respect to omega of that vector with everything else is zero. Um, so, so that means omega is, is not invertible. So we can fix that. The way we fix that is we simply impose an equivalence relation. So this is just like what how we do gauge how we uh, impose gauge redundancies. So if you have a redundancy in your in your theory, you just set that to zero. So I'm going to impose an equivalence relation delta one is equivalent to zero. In your head, you should think of gauge transformations. Of course, that that's where I'm going with this. The gauge transformations will be an example of variations 
such that the uh, symplectic form vanishes for all other variations. And that tells us that gauge transformation should be thought of as trivial on the phase space. And so then we can define the phase space by simply uh, modding out with, with respect to sigma, uh, with respect to this equivalence relation. And modding out just means that that transformation becomes trivial on the phase space. Okay. And finally, this again, I'm re rewriting this statement about, uh, about canonical transformation, then I'll come back to this. Okay, so that's all I had to say about the covariant phase space formalism. I'm now gonna apply this to gauge theory. Any questions? No? Uh, hi, may I ask? Either... Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so the delta phi, the linearized uh, variations, uh... Uh, can I think of this as a, uh, forming a subspace in the space of solutions in your previous slide uh, where you have E of phi equal to zero? Yes. Uh, and uh, you said that delta phi, uh, like uh, they are all variations of this phi, which also satisfy the equation of motion. So do the delta phi form a subspace in this space of E of phi equal to zero? No, no, no. delta phi is, uh, is an element of the tangent space. So, so okay. at every point phi naught, there's a tangent space. And delta phi is a vector on this tangent space. So it's okay. not an element of S, it's an element of the tangent space of S. Uh, okay, okay. So the gauge it, conditions it, it's, that... It's, it's, yeah, go on, go on. Uh, no, so the gauge conditions that uh, you will impose by modding out this delta one not equal to zero probably, so that will be on yes. delta phi or phi? Uh, both. We'll start by imposing a, a, a very good question. So we, I, over here, I've described uh, as if I'm in, uh, imposing it on delta one. But so what I'm really going to be doing is suppose I have a point here. Oh, that's a bad, but suppose I have a uh, suppose I have a point here, which is a uh, phi naught. And suppose my delta one happens to point in this direction. Delta one points in this direction. So this means that uh, any motion along the direction of delta one. I can now exponentiate that direction. So I can construct a whole curve in S that moves in the direction of delta one. And every element of that curve is, is to be considered equivalent to the starting element. So, that, so that's how you, the, you exponentiate the equivalence relation on the vector field to an equi equivalence relation on the full solution. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so let's just uh, let's just go ahead now and apply. Uh, it'll be probably easier if you actually see some equations. So let's apply it for for gauge theories. So I'm going to consider uh, Yang Mills theory with any semi compact semi simple gauge group with any action. So com totally general. And in what I'm writing over here, I'm in my talk. I'm going to only write down explicit formulas for just the Yang Mills part. But overall, you can include matter, do whatever you want, and there are general formulas for that as well. Uh, but I'm going to write in blue wherever there's this additional matter contribution. So LM over here is a matter Lagrangian. I, 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 I call it matter Lagrangian, but it can be anything. It could, it could include higher, higher derivative couplings between Fs. It could include you know, F cube terms, whatever, any, any random thing that you want to write. The main goal for me is just to focus on this term. As we'll see, this is on the only important term for, for my discussion. Uh, these are some trivialities, uh, tech, well, technicalities. A is a Lie algebra value gauge field, and I'm choosing my convention such that this is the without the factor of i. So T's are anti-hermitian. Okay, uh, let's vary. That's the first step we have to do. So this gives us equations of motion. And then the second term over here uh, gives you uh, the symplectic potential. And then as we've said, we can take the symplectic potential, integrate it over a sigma, and then take an exterior derivative to obtain the pre-symplectic form. So you go through that entire process and you get the pre-symplectic form here. Okay. I'll remind you of the formula so that you can see where it's coming from. So this thing is theta, so omega delta delta prime is delta theta delta prime minus theta 
So it's not hard to see that if I just apply this formula over here, that, that this follows. Okay. Okay. Now, as, as alluded to before, we'll see that this pre-symplectic form is in fact degenerate. Um, so I've just written it again here. So let's see that. So suppose I, I let's consider gauge transformations. So gauge transformations are a special type of transformations which act on my matter fields and gauge field in this way. So if I substitute this delta in this way right here, if I substitute this over here, so wherever I see delta prime, I'm gonna replace it with delta epsilon f, right? So delta epsilon f is minus f epsilon, something that I can work out from this, okay? And then similarly, there's a delta delta prime here. Also, this, this should become delta epsilon. Anyway, you substitute it. This is just a matter of algebra. And this is what you get. Okay. Importantly, notice that it's a boundary term, which didn't have to happen. But this is a special type of transformation. And we are working in gauge series. So the omega is defined on all of sigma. But once you substitute the gauge transformations, you only have the boundary term left over. In particular, what this means is that if epsilon vanishes on the boundary, then this term is zero. But delta epsilon is not zero. Delta epsilon is still acting non-trivially on all the fields. But if it vanishes on the boundary, then, then omega pre-vanishes. This implies that all gauge transformations such that epsilon vanishes on the boundary should be considered trivial on the phase space. Okay. Of, of course, this is something that you kind of already know, but I wanted to make it clear from this perspective and, and make the important distinction that it's important that epsilon has to vanish on the boundary. Only then is it trivial. Okay. And in, in a more general theory, you could have other degeneracies. You know, maybe if one of the fields in your theory is, is, is the graviton, then you also have diffeomorphisms. Then you have all sorts of other other uh, uh, degeneracies. You might may or may not have to introduce other equivalencies. Let's assume I've done all of that, and I can then define the the phase space. Okay. Good. But in fact, this formula tells us another nice thing. This formula right here tells us another nice thing. If epsilon does not vanish on the boundary then that gauge transformation is a canonical transformation, right? Remember canonical transformations. It was something that such that if, so delta C is a canonical transformation if this is true. So in fact, if epsilon does not vanish on the boundary, then it's not vanishing, but if further, more than that, we can in fact conclude that it's, uh, that, that type of transformation is a canonical transformation on the theory. So you can write down a charge for it. And that charge, which I'm going to call Q epsilon, is called the large gauge charge. And these type of transformations, I'm going to call large gauge transformations. Large in the sense that they don't vanish on the boundary, which is at infinity. So that's in, it's in that sense that it's large. Okay, and this charge generates gauge transformations on the phase space through the Poinsot bracket, you know, exactly as, exactly as needed. Another important canonical transformation that you uh, that we should talk about is isometry. So in particular, uh, translations and rotations. We know that these are also symmetries of the theory, so they should be canonical transformations on the phase space. And you can check that they are. Um, you, you get exactly this. But interestingly, uh, the charge corresponding to this, if you work it out from the phase space analysis, is not exactly what you, what you think. There's an extra term. Which is uh, corresponding to this, uh, which is where Q is just exactly this quantity here. Basically, epsilon is replaced by <clears throat> so you have this weird field dependent gauge transformation that you'd have to do uh, in addition to the usual charge, which you're all familiar with. Okay. Uh, this extra term will be interesting because it'll tell you that uh, this this extra term will act in the vacuum, and we'll see that the vacuum is not Lorentz invariant in a gauge theory. There'll be one vacuum which is Lorentz invariant, and that one vacuum is the one that we typically work with in standard quantum field theory, which is our assumption. We assume in quantum field theory that the vacuum is Poincaré invariant. 
I'm going to argue that there's infinitely many vacua. There's one vacuum, which is Lorentz invariant, and that's the one we work with in QFTs. Okay. Uh, and the algebra satisfies the usual charges. You can work out the algebra of the charges. So not, yeah, the, these formulas are not that important, but the result is included. Okay, we'll finally come to this important point that we alluded to earlier, which was the fields on the boundary. Again, let's recall, we have this property right here. Okay, now if this is not zero, if, uh, then that's a problem. Remember, all of the charges that we have here, we have defined through the symplectic form. So if the symplectic form changes as a function of sigma, then the charges also change as a function of sigma. In other words, momentum will not be conserved. Angular momentum will not be conserved in that theory. That's not what we want. You know, we might want it if, I have, if I'm studying open some certain open quantum systems and those sort of things are interesting. But in the context of S matrices, we don't want that. We want an S matrix that's rotation and uh, Lorentz invariant and, point, and translationally invariant. So to I'll reiterate, we, we want to set this second term to zero. Okay, now um, uh, one of the simplest ways to do this, which is again, what is done in quantum field theories, and we'll discuss that that's, we, we, we'll see that that's not a good thing. We can just assume that all the fields vanish on the boundary. So the, in, the, in the setup that I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of B as being spatial infinity and sigma, two will be scry plus and sigma one will be scry minus. So a very simple thing you can do is to just assume that all the fields vanish at spatial infinity, right? We do this. So we integrate by parts all the time, thinking that we can, we can uh, forget about the boundary term. Now we could do that. The problem will be that in that phase space, we won't have large gauge transformations. We'll have other problems, which I'll come to. But in particular, we won't have large gauge transformations. The reason for this is that under large gauge transformations, the gauge field transforms inhomogeneously. There's this extra inhomogeneous piece. So if A vanishes on the boundary, then I do a gauge transformation, then it no longer vanishes on the boundary, precisely because of this piece. So if you want to include large gauge transformations in your phase space as a canonical transformation, you're not allowed to assume that the gauge field vanishes on the boundary. It's too strong. In fact, this assumption in QFT is, is exactly the reason S matrices have IR divergences. Uh, this will be a comment at the, end of, at the end of my talk and I'll elaborate on it more. So instead what we can do is to not require that the fields vanish, especially the gauge field, because that's the only thing that transforms inhomogeneously. We can assume that the field strength vanishes at spatial infinity. The field, the field strength transforms covariantly, so F equal to zero is a large gauge invariant statement. And in particular, if F is zero on the boundary, this means that A is pure gauge. So on the, on the boundary, it's pure gauge. In other words here, again, the boundary that I'm thinking of is this boundary here and uh, this boundary here, which will turn out to be square plus minus and square minus plus. And it also vanishes on all of spatial infinity. <clears throat> okay, now this, is, this raises another problem. And the problem that it raises is that uh, this equation here is a constraint on gamma. So I had my gamma, which was defined as the space of all configurations modded out by gauge transformations. But now, now I'm imposing an additional constraint. And the constraint is that A is flat. The problem is, as, I've, as I told you, a phase space has to always be even dimensional. So if I impose one constraint, then it, the dimension reduces by one, it becomes odd dimensional. So on the reduced phase space, my symplectic form is no longer invertible. Okay, so uh, you can't just random, and this is the whole procedure, Dirac's procedure, where you have to work out second class constraints and third class constraints to work out what the correct phase space is. So we'll now have to go through that procedure. Uh, it won't be as messy and find another constraint that we'd have to impose so that once you impose a pair of constraints, you have an even dimensional phase space and then we can quantize it. So that's what we'll do next, find the next constraint. 
And we'll straight away go to Scry Plus and start talking about fields on Scry Plus and S matrices. Okay, May, let me pause here. Any questions? Okay, that's either a good so sign or a very bad. So sign. far, you have not yes. assumed anything about the dimension of space time, right? Yeah, so far, actually, everything was general. I haven't assumed it's four dimensions. I'm going to now. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, okay, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Uh, so, if if you have something like a like a monopole uh, in in your space yes. time, uh, so then uh, you will also introduce a boundary within the sigma. Yes. Exactly. Uh, so then, then actually, the, the, it, it, you you yeah, you'll find that you can no longer impose f equal to zero. I see. Okay. And, and as far as the uh, definition of these local uh, gauge, I mean the small gauge transformations, uh, they should vanish uh, at at the bound at the puncture that you have on the sigma. Yes, that's correct. That's. I mean, they should they should the the puncture will be at infinity, and small gauge transformations should vanish at infinity. So it should vanish everywhere at infinity. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Good. That's a very good question. I have the second to last point. The F, you just, I mean, in general, you want F to just satisfy the source free equations at spatial infinity, right? They don't have to, it doesn't have to vanish. Yes, that's. That's that's correct. That, that's correct. So as I said, it's uh, I've been a bit careful in my words. I've said the next simplest thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I see. Mm, yes. That's not necessarily the most general thing we can do. Uh, you are completely correct. What you should really the most general thing that one should do, uh, which which you have done in fact, is to is to study the theory near spatial infinity and find the equations of motion for f, sort of the constraint equations on f, and then solve those constraint equations. Yeah. Right. And you might find solutions which are more general than f equal to zero. Yes, uh, but in fact, this is uh, sufficient. The, the the kind of phase space I'm thinking of in my head is that I'm I'm here's what I'm trying to do. You start with the phase space assumed in quantum field theory, and then you do a large gauge transformation. Okay, that's the phase space I want to look at. Okay, there might be interesting physics in a larger phase space, but uh, well, it's not beyond the scope of this talk. Okay, so since in any case in standard quantum field theory we assume that A vanishes. So we're just doing a large gauge transformation of that. So A has to be flat. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, good. Okay, so uh, this is now part two of my talk. That was a bit of technicalities and this section will also be a bit more of technicalities, but after that it will be smooth sailing. So I, I, I hope you guys can hang on a little bit. Okay, so now I'm going to work on. I, I've so, so far, as Ashok pointed out, everything was totally general. General sigma, general dimensions, totally general. Uh, now I'm going to focus on four dimensions, and my sigmas that I'm going to choose are going to be null infinity. Okay, so so here's a drawing of of Minkowski space, space time, and the orange the orange shaded regions are what's called scry plus and scry minus. They are the regions where uh, null geodesics start on scry minus and they end, they move along 45 degree angles and they end on scry plus. Time like geodesics start and end on i minus and i plus. And if you want to consider a full theory with including massive particles and in, in complete generality, i minus and i plus are equally important, uh, but they, they, they introduce additional complications. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume that everything is massless. So I can really focus only on scry plus and scry minus and just forget about i plus and i minus. And spatial infinity is where space like geodesics start and end. Th that this surface won't really be that interesting for us. Okay. So uh, let's, let's set up some coordinates. The coordinates that I'll be working in, uh, x mu is Cartesian coordinates. So instead of working with Cartesian coordinates, I'm going to work in what's called flat null coordinates. They're called flat null coordinates for a very simple reason. This is the metric of Minkowski space-time in this coordinate system. So U and R are null coordinates, and they're, they're real. So they go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So R equal to minus infinity is scry minus, and R equal to plus infinity is scry plus. And U is the null generator of both scry plus and scry minus. 
Um, and the, the word flat is essentially because the transverse metric on SkyPlus is flat. The, the, the ones used, for instance, by um, uh, Stefan today, where the, the transverse metric was that of a sphere, you can do that. Sphere will give you additional Christoffel symbols and different additional curvature terms. I want to. I don't want to work with any of those. So everything is just purely flat in the ZZ bar direction. Okay, the boundary of the uh, the the surface that I'm looking at, the boundary of scry plus, is I plus minus. And okay, you might say that it. Uh, uh, sorry, this is uh, this is this should be scry plus plus. So you might say that scry plus plus is also a boundary. But uh, reality, scry plus plus is not a boundary of the Cauchy slice. The Cauchy slice includes scry plus and I plus, both of them put together. And scry plus plus is a common boundary. So if I look at the, if I look at the boundary of the full Cauchy slice, it's just uh, uh, I plus minus, scry plus minus, and scry minus plus. So the gauge field, which I said has to be flat, it has to be flat on these surfaces here. And these surfaces are uh, S2. Another interesting thing about the coordinate system that we that we are using is that it uh, the z used on scry plus is antipodal to the z used on scry minus. So the same coordinate z is automatically antipodal. So you might have heard of these things called antipodal matching conditions. Here it's just if I just say f of z equal to g of z with the same z, that's already antipodal. So it's a very nice coordinate system for many reasons. And that's what I'm going to work with. Okay, any questions about the, the structure? Okay, so now it's just some algebra. So I'm going to uh, go through this a, a bit quickly. So it's just a matter of using- Can I ask you a question? Uh -huh. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so when you said that the uh, field strength is uh, vanishes at the boundary, right? Which is in sky plus yes. minus. Uh, yes. Do you impose some fall off condition or is it that it, it has to fall off to zero? That's the only thing you need. Uh, no, so, so when, I say, when, I, when, I say these, when I say these constraints over here, so I'm assuming that uh, the direction in which I'm taking the limit towards the boundary is along the surface sigma, is along the surface here. So I'm actually not saying anything about what happens in this direction. The sigma that I'm that I have is quite plus. I'm only going to say what happens as I go in this direction here. Along the scry plus minus, that that that's not where you impose the boundary condition. Yeah, yeah. So this is scry plus minus right here. But I'm going to reach scry plus minus through scry plus. You could ask if I take a limit like this in this direction. Yeah, what, no, what no. I'm that? not talking about scry plus only. But as a function oh, okay. of you, you as a function yes. of you. Do you impose some particular fall off condition that how fast it should vanish? Oh, very good. No, 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 uh, no, no, no. In principle, uh, I am assuming that it's order one, and then I'm just going to set that order one piece to be zero. So the sub leading terms, I yeah, I don't care how fast they vanish. They are important for other. Per they are important if you want to study simultaneous. Uh, oh, they they are important if you want to study. Perhaps sub leading. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Sub leading ones is probably linear in you. Yeah, uh, I, I don't care how fast they fall off. Okay. Uh, but, but, but Prahar, for, they're for the important system. for the symplectic structure, structure to be convergent, right? For the... Yes, yes. So you need, it, you need them to be order one to be convergent. Uh, in, yeah. in, this, in this phase space, if you want to include super rotations and you know, more complicated things, then you, have to, then you actually have to say more about the fall offs. Right. But I'm, I'm doing just flat space time, nothing complicated. I'm not even doing divergent large gauge transformations, which is, very, which is also extremely interesting just finite large gauge transformation. So uh, for finiteness of the symplectic form, you just need it to be order one. Mm -hmm. That's what you need. You, yeah. you need it to be order one on both boundaries, scry plus plus as well as scry plus minus. And I'm gonna impose that on scry plus minus, even the order one piece vanishes. And on scry plus plus, there is an order one term and that's going to be important. Okay. I mean, that kind of rule out the linear in you. I mean, if you impose the, the linear in you from the symplectic structure perspective. Linear yes. Yeah. That this rules it out, but that it's actually not very hard to continue to continue okay. to include that because then you modify the constraint in the following way. You say that the, the at large u, there's a linear piece and there's a constant piece. You set the constant piece to zero, and the linear piece uh, is also pure gauge and sort of can be fixed by constraints. Okay. 
Though I, I don't know exactly what the right answer to that is. I should though, because I, I did write a paper on it, but but I, I don't remember now what, what the answer is. Okay. Okay, in, in reality, it's not going to matter. It's just, I, I just need the value at that at that point. Okay. So, uh, so, so here's some, some of the quick calculations. So I have A, uh, so this was my symplectic form and I've dropped the matter term for now. Again, just to, to, to stop cluttering. In this line, I've worked it out in my flat, in the flat null coordinates. AZ plus minus is simply, uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't, perhaps didn't make one point clear, but I want to make it very clear. Scry plus and scry minus are both independently Cauchy slices. So I'm not, I'm not considering sigma as the sum of these two surfaces. I'm considering them independently. Essentially, that's what the S matrix is. The S matrix is telling us that you construct the phase space on scry minus, you construct the phase space on scry plus, and there's a coordinate transformation that maps you from the coordinates on scry minus to the coordinates on scry plus, and that, that thing is called the S matrix, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm constructing everything separately on these two surfaces. But the formulas only differ by sign, so I'm just writing everything in one go. Um, so AZ plus minus is just the value of the gauge field out there. Okay, so as I've discussed previously, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take AZ and break it up into two pieces. Uh, a piece which is A hat, which is a function of U, and then a piece which is not a function of U, is just a boundary term. And uh, the boundary term, as we have said, is pure gauge. We want it to be pure gauge. So this is what I'm going to call this A hat mode is I'm going to refer to as the radiative mode. Sorry, just to be clear. It's a function of U. And then the C, which is an element of the Lie group, it has no U dependence. And this is going to be a zero mode or a soft mode. Notice, remember U is a time-like direction. So if something has no U direction, that means that that quantity commutes with the Hamiltonian. So it has zero energy. That's why I call it zero or soft. Okay, so I, I'm gonna plug this in, uh, plug this uh, decomposition in along with this flatness condition into the symplectic form, and then this is what I get. Again, it, you don't have to worry about the exact details. It's just a matter, I just wanted to show you some equations. Uh, here, uh, to write this, I had to define this quantity, nz. And nz is just the integral of fuz. And in this line, I've, just, I've written it in a suggestive way, essentially to show you that this is really the soft gluon mode. The mode that in the section five, we're gonna talk about soft theorems and soft insertions, that essentially taking a soft limit and a scattering amplitude corresponds to inserting this n. Because that's, it's it's related to, I'm doing a Fourier transform in the time. So omega is essentially the energy and then I'm taking the energy to be zero. So NZ is precisely the soft gluon mode. Okay, so uh, I've rewritten the symplectic form here. We know two features straight away. The first thing is that the radiative mode and the soft modes, N and C, they completely decouple. So I have just the, you can think of omega mu nu in matrix as a block diagonal matrix. So there's a one block diagonal part, which is just the A hats. So you can treat the radiative de degrees of freedom separately. And then the, there's a vacuum of soft or zero mode degree of uh, sector. And so there's a complete factorization. So I can just talk about them separately. I don't have to discuss them at the same time. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier, if you impose one constraint, you necessarily have to impose another constraint. Otherwise the symplectic form is not uh, invertible. And we can see this. The way we see this is that only the real part of dz nz bar enters the symplectic form. The imaginary part does not. So if I were to consider a variation such that the imaginary part has a non-vanishing variation and everything else is zero, then the vector field is non-zero, but the omega will vanish. So in order to do this, I have to force the, I have to project out from the, from the phase space, the imaginary part of dz and z bar. That's the only way I can, this is essentially a different way of doing Dirac's procedure, but directly from this, uh, from this covariant phase space uh, method. So 
uh, we have to do that. So we have to project out the imaginary part of, uh, of DZ and Z bar, which uh, gives us a constraint on N, which we can solve. So that gives us a constraint. Okay, so we now have two constraints. The symplectic for the phase space is again even dimensional. Now we have everything. We can invert perfectly. Everything is perfectly fine, even dimensional, and we can invert. So we have two soft modes. We have a soft mode C, which is an element of the gauge group, and we have a soft mode N, which is an element of the Lie algebra. And this is what the uh, go on. Can I ask one question? Yes. Isn't it more natural to think of this as an equivalence relation instead of a new constraint? Yes, yes, yes. What you uh, you should think of this as a gauge condition. You're absolutely right. What you what we should really do is that there's an equivalence relation, and so there's a whole class of solutions which are equivalent, and then you impose a gauge condition to pick out one of them to work with. Okay. So this is a gauge condition. Okay. Just like we impose gauge conditions in gauge theories to to pick out some representative of the gauge orbit. Okay, so this is the symplectic form. Now we can just invert it. So you 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 rewrite this and sort of you think of this omega as some infinite dimensional matrix and you invert it. It's a lot of work, uh, but we managed to do it. And this is the Poisson brackets or direct brackets if you want, because we've imposed constraints. So these are sort of the constraint versions of the, the brackets. So these are the brackets. Again, the radiative modes and the soft modes don't talk to each other, totally factorized. You can work out the charge. There's a soft piece uh, by soft. Again, every time I say soft piece, I mean something that depends only on the soft modes. And then there's a hard piece, something that depends only on the hard mode. This is expected. If the symplectic form factorizes and we're deriving all charges from the symplectic form, everything else has to factorize in much the same way. So there must also be a soft and a hard piece for the, for the charges. I'd like to mention that in, in a lot of previous work, when you, uh, including, including many of ours, when people refer to soft piece, they think of something that's linear in the fields. But that's actually, uh, that happens precisely in QED because QED is abelian. So the modes don't talk to each other. It happens in gravity because even though gravity is non-abelian, but the charge in gravity is the energy. So the soft graviton is abelian. The graviton with zero energy doesn't couple to other gravitons with zero energy. So in, in, when, you have a not, when you have an abelian system, which is what happens in QED and gravity, the, there's only a linear term. But in non-abelian theories, what you should really think of as the soft and the hard mode, soft mode is the thing that commutes with the Hamiltonian. It may or may not be linear. So here you see it's, it's very trivial, it's, it's highly non-linear because the C is an element of the gauge group. So we should really think of C as e to the phi, where phi is an element of the Lie algebra, and then you can expand in, in phi. So this is some highly nonlinear term, but it depends only on the zero modes. Okay. Okay, that's all I had to say. Uh, okay, so I, I'm essentially done with really all the technicalities. From now, uh, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, and it's going to be relatively smooth sailing. The algebra is tedious, but this is something that many of you have probably done lots of times, so it won't seem new to you. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to quantize this phase space. Uh, what that means is something very simple. You all functions are elevated to operators. The Poisson bracket uh, becomes the uh, quantum commutator, right? And then once you have the commutators of all the operators, you can construct the Hilbert space, which is a representation of these operator algebras. So that's the method I'm going to use to simply go ahead and construct my Hilbert space. Okay. Okay. So that's the end of end of most of the technicalities of this talk. So any questions? Uh, so the radi the u uh, the u dependence of the radiative mode is it read off from the fall off conditions of the f the field strength? Uh, you mean the the fall off conditions for a hat? Yeah, a hat z. Yes, you can. There's a formula for a hat written in terms of f because it is a radiative mode. So uh, it should be captured entirely by the field strength. There's a formula which is a z hat of u is one half integral du prime theta u minus u prime f 
u prime z. So if you know the field strength, you can do the, perform this integral and actually obtain uh, obtain a hat. Uh, okay, and then uh, this uh, c a b that you write it down. So uh, do you ah, have to impose any, any any condition on c a b or like it is also it also follows from something? Uh, no, no, no. I, I should have explained what c a b is. So remember, c was an element of the league group. So in order to write down this com these commutators, I had to find an explicit representation for it. So what I've done is I've, I've treated CAB as a matrix in the adjoint representation. Okay, so a matrix in the adjoint representation satisfies various properties. After all, C is an element of the D group. So for instance, it has to satisfy CC inverse is one, obviously. So uh, in the, uh, in the uh, adjoint representation, this, this implies CAC, CBC is delta AB. That's one constraint. And then an, another constraint you also have, which is uh, as FABC. Let me remember this if I can remember the C A D C B E C C F is F D E F. This is another another uh, cubic formula for C. So these are some constraints that it satisfies. But that just essentially comes from you know these sort of properties. That's really some group properties. Uh, remember, remember, uh, C itself is already the constraint field. So I have here C Z was the thing that has to be flat. So I've already solved the constraint, and I've written everything is in terms of this matrix C, group element C. So yeah. Yeah. it doesn't have, it doesn't satisfy any additional constraints. Thanks. Okay. So these are very interesting commutators. Uh, it, it sort of tells you that N and C are not really local operators because local operators have to commute at space-like separation, right? And the celestial sphere is at infinity. Any two points, you know, which don't have Z equal to W, they're necessarily space-like separated. Uh, so the fact that these commutators don't, don't vanish is tells us that C and N are actually, from the perspective of the dual CFT, is actually some non-local operator. And, and that's true. In fact, the they're shadow transforms. If you work out the commutator of the shadow transforms of these operators, you'll find something that's nice and local. So it, it has nice connections to, to the celestials amplitude stuff that, that Stefan was also talking about. Okay, so let's just quantize. Uh, so I, I, I've already uh, said, said this. So, so the quantization process is very simple. First, I take the, uh, let's just focus on the trivial part first, which is the radiative modes, because there's something you've always seen. The vacuum sector is interesting. We'll come to that second. So uh, this is the commutators for the for the radiative mode. All I've done is I've taken this and added i, one extra factor of i, and re replaced this with with the commutator. So that's that's what I've done here. Um, to bring this into a form that you're more familiar with, let me make some definitions. So I define these two operators here, and uh, where the arguments of the operator is a, a momentum p where the P is parametrized in terms of this omega Z, Z bar in the following way. So this is a massless momentum. And then you can just plug it in. You take these two definitions and plug it in over here and you get this. So this is just the standard commutation relations of creation annihilation modes. okay? So the Hilbert space, the radiative part of the Hilbert space is, a very, is just a Fox space. So you start by defining a vacuum a vacuum state which is annihilated by all the annihilation operators and then you just uh, act with creation operators and you're done. Okay, this is something you're all familiar with. Let's come to the more interesting, let's go to the more interesting feature which is the space of vacuum states itself. Now the vacuum state uh, forms a representation of the soft app operator algebra. Again, remember it was, it was interesting to note that the radiative piece and the soft parts factorized completely. So I can talk about the soft Hilbert space as a Hilbert space in its own right. Um, the commutators are, are this, again, simply factors of i have been added. So let's just start constructing it. This is all standard. C commutes with itself. So I can construct a basis where, which diagonalizes C. So I, uh, that's what I do here. So my basis element U is defined in this way. This is just a choice of normalization. Uh, remember here, U is an element of the gauge group. And then any other vector, uh, uh, any other state uh, in this Hilbert space can be obtained by simply uh, 
expanding in that basis. This is all I've done. F, F u over here is really just given the normalization I've chosen, F of u is just the inner product between the state F and the basis state. Okay, and the remain, well, really this commutator immediately you can show implies that the action of N on this basis state is given by this formula right here. Where D is some complicated derivative operator and we won't need its form. I'll give you the ex ex explicit form in the next page. We won't actually need any of it. All we need is this property. So that when it, when it acts on U, it gives you a delta function and then uh, an action of TA from the left. It's important, it's TA acting from the left. Again, this is a non-abelian gauge groups. Action from the left and right are totally different things. Okay, if you're not happy with this and you, you know, you're someone who wants an explicit formula, uh, you can look at this. So, so again, uh, U, is a, U is an element of the gauge group, so we can expand it, um, where phi is an element of the Lie algebra, and then this D is, is explicitly this operator here. You can write it down in perturbation theory and expansion in phi. Okay, you can also then, because we have the formulas for all the charges. So remember the charges, the charge was mentioned here. So it's an explicit function of C and N. So I know how to act on the, act on the state. It's, it's just an explicit matter of just working things out. And that's what I get. You can also define an operator that generates finite large gauge transformations. So that's what this does and it generates large gauge transformations uh, in this way, okay? So, okay. Now, I note here a second time again, the vacuum state that is assumed in standard quantum field theory is the one that has U equal to one. How do we see this? Remember CZ, which is C del Z C inverse. Um, so CZ when acting on this U state is U del Z U inverse. And in standard quantum field theory, we assume C is the boundary value of the gauge field. So we assume that CZ vanishes. So CZ vanishes if uh, U is equal to one or the identity in the Lie group. So whenever I write down Whenever I want to compare to standard quantum field theory answers, I just have to set u equal to one everywhere. So I'm going to derive a formula just now for general u, and then to make sense of it in standard quantum field theory, we just set u equal to one. Okay, so the formulas in this section might look new and a bit weird to you, but the process should be, I, in my, I hope, familiar. It's just a matter of quantizing some set of some set of brackets and constructing a Hilbert space from it. Okay, good. I'm almost done. Uh, section four, large gauge invariance of the S matrix. Before I start, any questions? Okay, we're slowly getting into the fun stuff. Uh, there's some technicality that we had to go through. Okay, so the first question is, uh, what is the S matrix? Uh, it, there's many, many interesting ways to define it. I'm just gonna think of, look at a practical definition, which is in quantum field theory, we define it using the LSE reduction formula. That's in fact how we compute everything. Feynman diagrams or whatever path integrals when we use that, all of them is at the end of the day using uh, the reduction formula. Uh, so the reduction formula is uh, just this uh, quantity over here where all the operators OI are some Fourier transforms of local operators. Psi I is any local operator that creates that one particle state. You know, it could do other things, but it, it should create that one, a normalized one particle state. So to, to relate the things we are doing, uh, to relate the S matrix to things that we have been doing, Everything we've been doing has been on scry plus, on scry minus. So we'll have to relate uh, these operators OI to the scry plus, scry minus operators that we've been talking about. Uh, 
they're, they're almost similar, but there's one crucial difference and that'll be important. So I, I'll talk about that. So let's just do it for a gauge field. You could do it for a general particle, you know, general matter field. Let's just focus on a gauge field. So for, for a gauge field, this local operator over here is one over G AZ. The one over G is just a normalization because our action was normalized as one over four G squared trace F squared. So there was an extra factor of one over G. My gauge field is not canonically normalized. So that's, that's what this one over G is over here. Um, so here you need to start with the off shell momentum and then take the momentum to zero. So I'm gonna parameterize an off shell momentum like this. And the off shell uh, limit is, on shell limit is mu goes to zero. Uh, we also have to worry about polarizations. And again, because the uh, formula, LSC reduction formula is gauge invariant, or the S matrix is gauge invariant, you can choose, choose any gauge condition you want. So this is a convenient definition for the polarizations. Okay. And then you just plug it in. So when you plug it all in, uh, at this stage, I've just literally plugged it all in and I haven't done anything yet. So now I'm going to take the mu goes to zero limit. The issue here is that uh, we know that there's an explicit factor of mu squared that's coming from this explicit factor of p squared. Okay, but there's also a mu sitting in here. So the only way for us to get something finite, I mean, for we'll almost always get something zero because there's a mu sitting here. The only way to get something finite is if I consider the localization of this integral at large r. Because when I consider localization at large r, it's going to pull down this entire factor as one over this factor. And then you might hope to get something, uh, something finite. For all other contributions, you'll just get zero. So we localize at large r. That's just a stationary phase approximation. And you get this localization. So as, as I said, when you localize at large r, uh, you pull down this factor. That's, that's what you get from the stationary phase. And then you get this limit. But this limit is in fact just the delta function. Times two pi. So all said and done, uh, you get this final answer. So that's exactly the operators that we had, that we defined before. With the, with the crucial difference that you have to take an out particle as well as an in particle. Again, you might be familiar with this. In standard, uh, you, you, you start with an S matrix defined with a bunch of out creation operators and in creation operators. But in order to derive the LSE reduction formula, you have to rewrite A out as A out minus A in. You introduce a time ordering operator, so the A in annihilates the vacuum. So you actually haven't done anything. And the A out minus A in can be written in terms of a local field. And so that, that's, that's all that's going on here. So uh, I, as I mentioned here, when omega is positive, only one of these operators contributes because one of them is a creation operator. The, uh, both of them are, if omega is positive, both of them are annihilation operators. And the in annihilation operator annihilates the vacuum and the out annihilation operator creates the outgoing state. If omega is negative, they're both creation operators the out creation operator annihilates the vacuum and the in creation operator gives you, well, gives you the incoming particle. So in, in both cases, only one of the operators contributes. The other one vanishes. However, in the crucial case, when omega is zero in the soft case, both operators contribute because in the soft case, they're both zero mode operators. In, in particular, they're both NZ. Okay, NZ, remember, let me define it for you again. NZ was simply integral du FUZ. So they're both zero mode operators and they no longer annihilate the vacuum or they don't even create a new particle, but they act on the vacuum and shift it. And we'll see that the fact that taking a soft limit is the same thing as shifting the vacuum is precisely what gives you the soft here, among other things. Okay. Okay. Finally, we'll come to our main result. Uh, just there. So now, just a just a just a bunch more things. 
uh, here, when I was writing my LSE formula, I took the liberty of generalizing also to arbitrary in and out vacuum states. Typically, when you see this reduction formula in a standard textbook, this will just be zero and zero because it's assumed that the vacuum is unique. I'm no longer assuming that. I've shown that you can't assume that. So you have a generic in and out vacuum. But as I've shown, uh, you know, we discussed a generic in and out vacuum can always be expanded in the U basis. So I just need to consider this most, most general quantity here. Okay, so uh, let's first consider uh, to, to, to actually derive the main formula of my talk. Uh, I'm gonna consider two insertions. The first one is I'm gonna consider insertion of C over here. So I'm gonna consider inserting C over here. The point is that C commutes with all the radiative operators. Not only that, it also commutes with the soft operator because the soft operator is n plus minus n minus. So it doesn't commute with n plus, it doesn't commute with n minus, but it commutes with n plus minus n minus. The difference uh, it commutes with C, which you can see from the algebra. So in fact, this C commutes with all possible operators that you could have inside when you're discussing an S matrix. So I can just move it around freely. So I've done that here. If you just move the C over here, you, you, you jump, you jump, you jump, and you just move it all the way to the side. And you can do that freely. There's no cost to it. So essentially the statement is that if I do that, you just get zero. The difference between C on the left and C on the right is just zero. But C on the left acts in the vacuum, gives me U. C on the right acts on the other vacuum, U prime, and gives me U prime. So this just tells me that there's a delta function constraint on the S matrix, so the, that uh, the, the S matrix is vanishing unless U is equal to U prime. So the formula uh, simplifies significantly. The amplitude is just uh, this quantity. All we need to do now is, to is that we have to determine this. This is some function of U. We now just have to figure out what this function is. To do this, I'm gonna consider insertions of the large gate charge. Remember omega g is e to the uh, exponent of minus i q epsilon. So we know what omega g does. It simply generates gauge transformations on my phase space, on all the operators in, in the theory. So let's consider this insertion on the left where I've inserted an omega inverse here and an omega there. And trivially, I can move this in, move this in, and then just rewrite everything in, in this form. So all the internal omegas will just cancel among each other. So this equality is really trivial. But on the left, this omega g acts on the vacuum, right, and gives me uh, g times u, this omega g inverse also acts in the vacuum and gives me g times u. Omega g inverse is omega g dagger. So it's a unitary operator. Whereas uh, this guy simply gives me the gauge transformation of this, the finite gauge transformation. So it transforms in a representation R1 of g uh, z bar and then times the, times the operator. So that's, that's all there, there is to it. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's, how, that's how I get this formula right here. Uh, but to simplify it even further, we can just uh, set u equal to one everywhere. So there's two, op there's u and g. So I can just set u equal to one and I'm gonna relabel g in terms of u. So the end, end of all of this, we get this, which is our main formula for the theory and what I'm calling soft factorization. In other words, now let me go to the next page. I've boxed it nicely over here. The claim is that you have infinitely many vacua. You can define an amplitude, a scattering amplitude in arbitrary in and an arbitrary out vacuum, but large gauge invariance completely fixes the vacuum dependence of the S matrix. That's what this formula is telling us. You choose any in vacuum, you choose any out vacuum, then the vacuum dependency, all you need to do is compute this path integral right here. 
And everything else is just the QFT amplitude. That's the thing you compute using Feynman diagrams. Large gauge transformations doesn't have anything to say about that. So the vacuum dependence are, is completely fixed. Now this formula, perhaps on its own, may not be as surprising to, to some of you, but the tools that we have used and some of the ideas that we have gained in the process are in fact very interesting. And, 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 and can be used more generally for, you know, for very general applications. Um, in particular, to study infrared divergences. That would be very interesting. That's kind of where at least I'm motivated to go towards. We, have, we are not there yet. Okay. Um, perhaps another interesting thing to note is that this quantity here, uh, we can interpret this as e to the minus s where S, this S is some action for the soft modes. So this action sort of depends on the in and out wave functions. But perhaps the, the, the idea of Fadiv and Kulish is that there is a particular choice of in and out vacuum states, which, which are the correct choice in some sense, which gives you IR finite S matrices. And that's the, that's the basis. Those are the vacuum states that you should be working with. We have some guesses for what that has to be in non-abelian gate series, and the corresponding action for that turns out to be the WZW action. That's a very interesting feature. Uh, in effect, once you have WZW, you naturally have Katz Moody currents. And so the presence of Katz Moody currents in non-abelian gate series, which is something that was discussed a long time ago, is also follows directly from this WZW structure. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to explore that further, but uh, that's not entirely done. Okay. Uh, finally, this is the final section. Um, let's now show how this is a general formula, which holds for essentially all vacuum states. We now show how we you can use this to derive the soft theorem. Now, in some sense, uh, you could say, and you'd be right, I think, that I'm, I've introduced so much complicated formalisms, and I'm going to use all of that to derive the soft theorem. That's like using a sledgehammer to kill a fly. It's like Soft theorems can be derived using many different ways. Ashok gave a fantastic set of lectures where there was such nice ways to derive things. Was there really a necessity to go through this complicated technical formalism just to derive soft? If your only goal was to derive soft theorems, then definitely no. But I do think that this formalism is important because number one, it's very systematic. Nothing was assumed. Everything was systematically uh, constructed. And the, it tells us a lot more about the phase space, the, the, the Hilbert space, the structure of the, of the Hilbert space, the commutators, the operator algebras on the Hilbert space. So there's lots more that we know. And uh, perhaps we can use that to, to say more interesting things about, uh, in, in, in particular, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the formalism sort of tells you about the full nonlinear structure of uh, non-abelian gauge series. Nowhere did I assume that I had to linearize in some background. And the problem that often happens with, with non-abelian gauge theories is that you can only derive things in perturbation theory. Because of the non-commutativity of the gluons, it's very hard to make, to exponentiate results, which is something that you can trivially do in gravity and QED. And so the full non-linear structure of the soft factorization of, of, a, of uh, uh, non-abelian gauge theories is not really known that well. So my hope is that we've, we've set up some structure that's very nonlinear and captures all the uh, soft physics, but that's essentially all you need to understand the, uh, the full classification of IR divergences. Um, okay, so with that out of the way, we'll still end up going and talking about the soft theorems and we'll end on this. Okay, so uh, before I end, any questions? If you had worked in dimensions other than four, say even dimensions, yeah, uh, how much of this um, would change? Meaning, how, can, can you get something in other even dimensions? I feel like a lot of it could significantly simplify, because unless I'm missing something, unless I'm missing something, the 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 special thing that happens on in four dimensions is that the gauge field doesn't vanish in the large R limit. In other words, the gauge field is order one on square plus, which means that the gauge field as well as commutator of the gauge field, which is what you have the nonlinear structure, both of them survive on square plus. 
Uh, what happens, for example, in six dimensions, the gauge field is order one over R. So the commutator of the gauge field is order one over R squared. It's, it's subleading in R. So you never see the nonlinear structure at square plus. Everything essentially becomes a billion by the time you reach square plus. So I'm going to guess that the, the structure, uh, that being said, in, 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 it is also true that in higher dimensions to extract soft theorems, you actually have to go to subleading orders. The leading order is not enough. So it might just, what might be happening is that uh, you, in higher dimensions, you have to go to a particular subleading order to extract the soft limit and the soft theorems and the soft factorization, all of these are related. And it's exactly at that order where all the nonlinearities also show up. So, yeah, it might be, I, I don't have anything more to say, but it, it, it'll probably be also very interesting to look at. But we'll have to worry about the additional complications of the fact that we have to look at subleading orders in R. I see, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. So, so Prahar, about this uh, Kulish Fadiv, uh, I, I mean, the parallel in Young Mills are these generalized coherent states, uh, the, you know, the, the ones that Catani et al. had derived. I mean, yeah, yeah. So is that the, I mean, is this something? I mean, there, there, were, there, were, there were a couple of works, uh, I think Atira and Anupam and also some German groups yeah. that, uh, conservation law give you the... Yeah, the, those, those, a lot of those works, yeah, yeah I've, I've seen those, those works all uh, derive, uh, you know, those works all derive the, the, the dressing order by order in perturbation theory. Yes, yes, yes. Um, which well, I mean, which is you know already very good. That's definitely a great jump. But given the the fact that the entire nonlinear structure is essentially controlled by a gauge by a Lie group, so there should be some symmetry principle that essentially fixes the nonlinearities. I believe. I see. So uh, my goal is to sort of understand the full nonlinear structure, not have to uh, not have to talk about things in perturbation theory. I see. But if, uh, that, if you look, yeah, yeah. But if you look at the exponent of the Catani's coherent state, like it doesn't. I mean, it's it doesn't. There's no. I mean, I don't think there's any resummed form that they have. Even the QCD in QCD. Yeah. So it like just doesn't. Even the exponent doesn't terminate, right? It's like an infinite series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't terminate. It doesn't terminate. But uh, the the idea is if you work with the right variables. So the variables that people always work with because it's it's natural in the mm -hmm. in quantum field theory is creation annihilation operators. You, yes, yes. you 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 construct some. You have the exponent e to the sum creation annihilation operators, and then you have an infinite sum of creation annihilation operators. But uh, the idea is that that's perhaps not the right basis. There's there is this nice basis which is naturally picked out when you do this covariant phase space business. Mm -hmm. And so as I said, N Z for instance. Uh, was some complicated, the Q epsilon, the mm -hmm. soft charge, was some complicated nonlinear function. Yes. Okay. So if I try to think of that as in terms of creation operator, the Q epsilon itself is contains infinitely many terms as a function of creation annihilation. Okay. okay. So uh, just a wild guess would be something like e to the e to the Q epsilon would be would have the structure that they have. Q epsilon automatically has an infinite sum of creation annihilation operators. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of finding the right basis to actually work. Okay, in. but the the state you have this capital U state is effectively some like some version of the Catani generalized code. Yes, I, I I believe so. This is still this is still in progress, so I okay. don't want to commit. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so in the last well, I have five minutes. I'm only going to focus on the single soft theorem, but. I, I do want to add that uh, we also have figured out how to do the double soft, uh, double consecutive soft limit. This was a potential uh, issue because uh, the double soft limits don't commute with one another. Uh, typically, oh, well, they don't commute. They commute if they have same helicity. If they have different helicity, they don't commute. So you have to also define a notion of ordering of soft operators. And once you do that correctly, the algebra essentially tells you how to insert uh, the soft modes, and we find exactly that the that the algebra of the soft modes matches precisely with the algebra of the soft limits. So the double soft limits also work, but I won't have time to go into that. So let me just finish up, uh, finish my talk by uh, making comments about the single soft quant theorem. So as I uh, mentioned earlier in an earlier slide, a soft limit essentially corresponds to insertions of this type of insertion here. Uh, uh, so, so if I want to derive it, here's an amplitude. I'm taking a soft limit. Uh, it corresponds to inserting n. Uh, 
Okay. Now there's a time ordering operator here, which tells us that I should move n plus, n plus lives on square plus. So I move that out here and n minus, I move it out there. So essentially they just act on the vacuum states. Now we know how to determine this. The, you know, we spent essentially half of the talk deriving the algebra. So this is just something you can derive using all the algebra explicitly. Uh, you derive it, uh, you plug it back in and notice something interesting that happens. And it, this is why it was important that the insertion is n plus minus n minus. This exact form was super important because of, for the following reason. n plus acts on the ket bra and gives you a derivative acting on the bra. Okay. N minus does the same thing and gives you another derivative acting just on the bra state, right? With an, with an extra minus sign, that's important. So this minus sign coupled with this minus sign essentially gives me a total plus sign. And now I can use the, now essentially as the derivative chain rule because I have one term in which the derivative is acting on the bra, but not on the ket and have plus another term where it's acting on the ket, but not on the bra. So together they add up and they give me this term where the derivative is acting on you know, the entire quantity. And now I can use my, uh, my, my uh, factorization formula. So I go here, so this was just what I had previously. Now I just use my factorization formula because I know what this is. And I have, and I also remember, uh, recall the definition of D. So I just have to act D on, on each of this and I'm done. And you just act on it and you, you get this answer. Now this is, in fact, we have, gen, we have derived something that's more general. We have derived the soft theorem in any vacuum. I mean, we've derived it in a U vacuum, but now I can multiply by, multiply by the wave functions, the vacuum wave functions and the integrate so it, it, it derived it in, in, in arbitrary uh, vacuum states, but to match it to QFT, so we, we, we can check whether we are correct, we set U equal to one, because that's, that's what QFT does. And you set U equal to one and it simplifies and you, you get a very nice simple formula. And though it doesn't look like it perhaps uh, uh, to the uninitiated, but it is this single soft theorem. To, to check this is just, again, another matter of algebra. This is the standard soft theorem in momentum space spaces, uh, which this I'm sure you're familiar with. And then all you have to do is substitute these, these uh, parameterizations of the momentum. This is what we've been using all this time. So you substitute it and you get this. So it, it, it actually works out. Um, okay, this was some stuff about the double soft theorem, which I'm not gonna uh, be able to get to. Um, let's just... Uh, I just want to make a comment about those those complicated commutators that we had over here. It does not look like it, but if you work it out, it's a very tedious bit of algebra, but you end up showing that NZ commutator with NZ prime is zero. And NZ correspond to insertions of positive helicity gluon and NZ bar, NZ prime also does the same thing. So this tells us that the, if the gluons have the same helicity, the soft limit should commute. Uh, and it's given to you by the algebra itself. This is some tedious calculation, so it did not have to work out this way, but it surprisingly does. And the same thing, if I try to look at uh, the, uh, the commutator of NZ with NZ bar, uh, th this corresponds to the, uh, the commutator of soft limits of one positive helicity gluon and one negative helicity gluon. Then that's not zero, it's some very complicated formula. But when you plug it into the S matrix, um, and simplify, you get, you get this, this quantity, which is also exactly the correct answer. And by correct answer, I mean, you take the soft theorem, which is this, this very complicated looking formula in momentum space, and you substitute PK, Q, epsilon, you know, all the formulas, which we have done here into this, into this grand looking quantity. It's, it doesn't even look like it, but in fact, if, if H and H prime are both positive helicity, this entire quantity vanishes. But if H and H prime are of opposite helicity, then it doesn't vanish, but it simplifies precisely to, to, to this result here. Okay, so the, so the double soft limits also work. Finally, let me, let me summarize since I'm out of time. Okay, so if you're asleep throughout the talk, I don't blame you, there was a lot of technicalities.
but if nothing else you can you can go out with this uh, uh, gauge series non gauge series including non abelian gauge series have infinitely many vacuum states this factorization formula tells you the vacuum dependence of the s matrix completely fixes the vacuum dependence doesn't fix anything else um, okay uh, it correctly reproduces those consecutive soft limits in fact we know it also correctly reproduces simultaneous soft limits which is more general but i didn't speak about it here and uh, this is one of the reasons the paper has been delayed there are still some kinks we have the right mathematical formulas there's some physics we don't quite understand so the, uh, it, but it does tell us some interesting non local physics we know that the celestial cft that that stefan was talking about whatever it is it's going to be non local in some some complicated way precisely because of translational invariance so that non locality is something that you can actually study by studying simultaneous soft limits there's a lot of information about the non localities hidden in the simultaneous soft limits so we have all the correct formulas there's some physics that we don't quite understand but i think you can also do simultaneous soft limits so if that's true and if we can work out all the kinks the complete soft factorization of an s matrix uh is completely fixed entirely by just this factorization formula um okay uh quantum corrections are also easily included uh, we know the the soft theorem is quantum corrected and in principle it's in principle one should be able to include it by simply starting with the one pi effect of action so you do the covariant phase space but instead of working with the classical action you just do the one pi action and uh, this is ongoing work i'm hoping that this will give us the correct quantum corrections as well okay and i'll just end on this uh, the connection to ir divergences is that the, we have related everything to the qft amplitude right but it is well known that the qft amplitude is in itself ir divergent and the ir divergence essentially factorizes in this way this is very schematic uh, but there's some sort of factorization there's an explicit formula in a paper long ago by matthew schwartz and ilia feige where these factors are essentially wilson lines so they have a wonderful it's like a 100 page paper where they work out this most complicated factorization but it's a very nice formula and there's some there's some factorization so what's interesting is that even the ir divergence is factorized so in other words i i can i can write this formula over here as some as some uh, ir divergent factor times something that's finite so if i can find appropriate similarly ir divergent wave functions if i can find appropriate ones that can cancel this this divergence then the overall s matrix will be ir finite okay so that's the goal that's how you go about finding ir finite s matrices we know that the qft amplitude is ir divergent so you choose a compensating ir divergent wave function and if you choose it correctly then the ir factors should cancel and then you over get an overall ir finite amplitude now we are sort of in the process of doing this sorry prahar but and, the uh, collinear sorry prahar the collinear ones yeah. this charges cannot fix uh, fix right the collinear part of the factorization this. also the collinear part also the collinear this is what simultaneous soft theorems have really taught us something very interesting it turns out that the distance the, it, things seem to be like you we think about ope on square plus so it's like ope but it's on a null surface uh -huh. and so it turns out that the the correct thing to talk about is not when people think about op what they think about is z goes to w right yes. that's the limit they're looking at yes but in fact because of the covariantness and because i'm really sitting on a null slice and it's crucial that i'm sitting on this null slice the actual quote unquote distance is something that looks like z minus w divided by u that's the covariant distance mm -hmm. what this means is that you the op applies when u goes to infinity which is the soft limit but it also applies when z goes to w which is the collinear limit so there's just a single quantity which characterizes both collinear factorization as well as soft factorization mm -hmm. and so you there's just one ope and this one ope characterizes everything including soft as well as collinear factorization i see uh, yeah okay thank you yeah okay um so um so in the language of asymptotic symmetries this exact story that i'm telling you here to choose a compensating wave function here was essentially done for qed and what they did for qed was essentially this they, they showed they, by they i mean uh, these authors here which correspond uh, malcolm perry and kustrominger 
Anna Marie, Anna Marie uh, Lacrario, uh, Rotlario, and Dan Capitz. They showed that if you choose my vacuum state to be an eigen uh, state of Q epsilon, then the uh, corresponding uh, S matrix computed in that vacuum is IR finite. Uh, we can't do that in non-abelian cases, unfortunately, because the charges don't commute. That's what it means to be non-abelian. The charges don't commute. So you can't construct states that are eigenstates of Q epsilon. The next best thing you can do is you can construct states which are eigenstates of NZ. Because remember, NZ commutes with NW. Um, so this is sort of a guess that we have. So the correct answer is that we should choose eigenstates of NZ. There are some interesting motivating features of this quantity. Some motivating features, if you try and work out the wave function for uh, states which diagonalize NZ, and you substitute it into this formula right here uh, to obtain the effective action E to the S, the action turns out to be the one of uh, the WZW model. Now, the WZW model naturally contains currents, Katz Moody currents. So, this explains the presence of Katz Moody currents in non abelian case theories from the soft perspective. So, it's, that's kind of all the motivation that we have. It looks very nice, and it would be great if that was actually the correct answer, but it requires a lot of calculation. So, this is kind of one of the things that's more future work. But it's very interesting that the, so essentially, if true, this would tell us that it's really the WZW model that is part of the celestial amplitude or the dual theory. So whenever I have a non-abelian gauge theory, or a gauge theory in general, the dual theory necessarily has a wedge sumino witten coupling term, which couples to everything else. So, so things should then form representations of the wedge sumino witten gauge group. Uh, and so if true, that gives a lot of interesting symmetry structure, even just for the hard particles. So for example, there are null state relations, which you can write down, which has nothing to do with the Katz-Moody currents, but it's a, it, a null state relation gives us constraints on the hard amplitudes, purely the hard amplitudes. So that would be very interesting as well. Anyway, so this is all for or for mostly like future future prospects and work. Okay, I'll stop. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll stop for questions. So, do we have more questions? Uh, I guess there were some questions during the talk. So if not, let's all unmute and thank Prahar for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Okay, thanks Prahar. Thanks. See yes. you all tomorrow. Yeah. Yes, see you. See you.